Well, thank you very much, PJ. I'd like to uh, segue right into our panel, and Reginald Dale will be our moderator for the panel, correct? Or do we abolish the coffee break? Yes? He says we've abolished the coffee. No, we haven't. How many of you would like a coffee break? We've abolished the coffee break. So for those of you who'd like coffee, there's coffee outside, but because it's upstairs. See how well informed I am? If you'd like a, a cup of coffee, please help yourselves to it. But otherwise, uh, to keep things on track, we'll, let's uh, invite our panel up uh, now, and uh, um, Reginald Dale will be your tour guide and your moderator, and he will introduce your panelists. That was uh, very democratic. I'm going to get a. What I extract? Would you want me? Yeah. Right, these are all live. These mics are all live. Yes. Hands up, anyone who can't hear. Uh, joke. Um, good. Well, um, we'll continue with the, the panel. We were just going to speak briefly, each of us, and then um, have a discussion. Um, I'm not actually going to introduce any, everyone at great length because you have the panels, the uh, bios. Uh, everyone has the bios in, in their um, material, and I'd rather spend time on the discussion than uh, lengthy biographical details, which everyone has access to anyway. Um, I wanted to, to um, take the moderator's um, prerogative just to say a, a couple of things. Um, first, picking up something that, that PJ Crowley just said about, about um, holding government accountable, uh, the media's role, and he, he also said that that was the role of the media around the world, which, which it, it is. But there's a very um, big difference between the media in a parliamentary system like the European and um, uh, the US system, which I think is not always uh, uh, fully appreciated, uh, which is that in a parliamentary system, a, um, a government, and particularly a, a leader, a prime minister, is accountable to the people through parliament. And the leader goes and submits him or herself to questions in parliament. Whereas in the United States, the leader never goes to Congress to be questioned as a sort of parliamentary question time, but holds a press conference and is accountable to the people through the media rather than through parliament. And I think that this um, gives the American media a kind of quasi-constitutional role uh, that is not um, the same as that enjoyed by the media in, in Europe. Uh, and, and is also is accountable in some ways for the, the very high esteem in which some members of the U.S. media hold themselves uh, as tribunes of the people, uh, whereas some of my colleagues in uh, Fleet Street tend to regard the whole thing as a, a bit of a, a game uh, rather than a serious constitutional exercise. It's no surprise, perhaps, that most of the um, people who write those supermarket tabloids that you find about how I 
married an alien space invader are, are actually journalists uh, from Fleet Street um, who are not fulfilling their constitutional role in the uh, process. Um, I just want to say one or two sort of um, bull bullet points about the difficulty of working with the US media today, particularly today, because the, the polarized, political polarization of the country is also reflected in the media. I mean, it's, it's a chicken and egg problem. Is the country polarized because the media is polarized or vice versa? Well, I think it's a, a actually a bit of both. Um, just um, uh, about two weeks ago, I, I read a column in, in the Washington Post, and right before the end, um, the writer said, uh, used the phrase, I can't believe I'm writing this. And she put that in context. She had been writing about uh, the policies of uh, the Republicans in Congress, and she was talking about John Boehner, the Republican leader in Congress. And just before she finished, she said, I can't believe I'm writing this, but I actually agree with one of the points he made. Now, that, that to me was astonishingly revealing. I mean, I, th I think it was meant to be a sort of, it was partly that she felt guilty she was agreeing with a Republican. She had to somehow apologize to all her friends, her liberal friends, um, that she was actually saying that she agreed with a Republican. On, but she felt that she couldn't agree with a Republican on one single small point without somehow um, excusing herself or apologizing for it. And, and to me, uh, I, I spent many years as a columnist, and we were always uh, told that we ought to be unpredictable and <laughs> surprising in our, in our comments. Uh, this was astonishing in, in, in indicating that basically what she was going to do in all her columns was um, to rehash the, 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 the Democratic Party line. And sure enough, she had a piece in at the end of last week commenting on Republican policies in Congress on uh, jobs, and it was n the complete Democratic Party line. And, and I sort of wonder, what's the point of being a columnist if all you're going to do is, is write the, the speaking points from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? And, and we've got to a point where if you look at the columnists in the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, the two papers that PJ reads uh, every morning, you, you can just about classify them uh, in advance, know what they're going to say. Um, it might be helpful if they had little blue or red stickers on top um, so you didn't have to read the um, column and you knew which one was identified with which uh, party or maybe a you know, blue sticker with a couple of red dots on because they occasionally <laughs> agree with one point a Republican has made. So uh, I, I suppose, and, and, and then I was reading Politico the other day, a, a serious analysis of... Um, what well, seemed to be a serious analysis uh, of uh, the, the run-up to the midterm elections and the polls and, and, and how the parties were doing. And I suddenly came across uh, this phrase, our side. And so, of course, th this wasn't written as, an, uh, as a... The writer had maybe inadvertently given away the fact that the writer was looking at it from one side or another, our side. Now, to me, that completely, ju just as the comment in the column destroyed the credibility of the column, this destroyed the credibility of the analysis. Why should I go on with this analysis if, if it's written to, make, to advance the view of, as the writer put it, our side? Um, and you find it even more, of course, as um, Peter Crowley was just talking about in, in the um, cable news, uh, TV, uh, cable news, where actually the last two years show that uh, the more you make a program ideological, the more the ratings go up, but both in, um, on the liberal side and conservative side, in fact, more on the conservative side uh, than the liberal side, the, the, the ratings go up. Um, you find it in, in, in blogs at, and uh, here again, they tend to polarize because liberals tend to read liberal blogs and conservatives read conservative blogs. And so you're constantly reading people who agree with you and go a bit further, more towards the extreme, and you think, oh, it's all right. 
You know, and here's this blogger saying this. It's, it's respectable to think this. And so there's a tendency to pull each in, in the direction away from, from the center. And um, the, the only good news on that front is I, I, I read an estimate that only 1.5% 1 1 of Americans read political blogs. Um, and I also read somewhere else that um, uh, blogs are actually beginning to decline in uh, quantity, which I thought was splendid <laughs> news for all, for all of us. First of all, we don't have to read so many, and secondly, we won't have to write so many. Um, but I suppose what I'm saying is, is that more than ever, it's incredibly important to, when you're looking at the U.S. media to be aware of, wh aware of where this is all coming from and wh which where the, the, the particular media outlet stands in, on the political spectrum or, or on any other right, left, or um, uh, belief system. And, and I think one of the problems of, of people working in Washington is that the main... I spent uh, nine years working in, in the newsroom of the Washington Post, not for the Washington Post, but in there. And, and it, it is that here you have a paper that is... Uh, goes to enormous lengths to try and be, uh, as it would see itself, neutral or unbiased and so on, uh, and, and, and to be where um, the center is without being biased. But its view of where the center of American opinion is is much further to the left than where the center of opinion actually is, and the same applies to the New York Times. So if, if you're just looking at those two papers, you have to keep remembering that you are not looking at uh, uh, papers which reflect the viewpoint of the average American. And is another uh, consequence of that is that, that for foreign correspondent in Washington, is, to me, it is absolutely essential to get out of New York and Washington and go around the country and uh, talk to people in, all around the country, or you won't ever really understand um, the United States. Uh, we, uh, the organization I run actually has a, a, a program for visiting European um, media fellows, and we send them out to do precisely that, and they come back with the most incredibly uh, enhanced uh, understanding of the, of the United States. Uh, I know it's not always um, easy to do that. Um, th there are, uh, I, I won't belabor that point any further, the, 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 there are some uh, good things happening, I think, which is that um, uh, Americans are um, the news consumption of Americans is actually going up at the moment. Americans are spending more time um, uh, following the news than at any time in the last uh, decade. They're still getting. Um, uh, I have all sorts of figures here. Um, uh, 29% uh, tw uh, of Americans, I think, still get news from newspapers, or, although that's much um, smaller from uh, the under 30s. Um, and and the, there's a general view around that. I mean, what's happening is, is that, 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 that American consumers on the whole are adding news from electronic media and websites to the other traditional sources uh, of, uh, from which they get news, rather than um, compensating by reducing the traditional sources. And, and th there's a myth going around, which I'm glad this is a myth, um, that people increasingly get their news from uh, the John Stewart show and the Colbert Report and so on. And this, uh, this uh, I just have a, a table here of surveys of... Um, big survey that's been done on this. It turns out that, in fact, that's not the case. Um, that um, here, for example, uh, where do you go? Do you go to the Colbert Report for the latest headlines? 3% say yes. Do you go to John Stewart's Daily Show for in-depth reporting? 2% go for in-depth reporting. Do you go for entertainment? the figures are in the 40s and 50%. So, I mean, th th this idea that somehow we're all being taken over by these comedy news shows is not, is not um, uh, sustained uh, by the surveys. Um, th that said, um, uh, I, I do think that 
the biggest challenge is still um, identifying what, what is a, a, a neutral, unbiased, um, um, factual, as far as it can be, report in the American media, and that's what I'm hoping that we're going to um, pursue uh, with this panel. So um, the idea was that we would speak in alphabetical order, which I think puts Sean uh, in the next, uh, uh, next in turn. All right. Is this on then? Can you hear me? Great. Um, all right. Uh, my name's Sean Ade, and I'm a professor here at uh, George Washington University in the School of Media and Public Affairs, and the, uh, usually the director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, uh, although I'm blissfully ensconced on sabbatical this year, and uh, so actually my golf game's improved dramatically until the rain started. But um, anyway, I'm supposed to talk about uh, how the U.S. media covers the rest of the world and covers U.S. foreign policy in general. Um, which are not two of the same things. Um, I thought it was fascinating listening to P.J. Crowley. For one thing, hearing P.J. Crowley talk about Twitter is interesting because P.J. Crowley has one of the all-time great tweets uh, of the last uh, few months, which I guess is really about it, the life cycle of Twitter almost, but um, in which uh, when an American was um, imprisoned in North Korea and former President Jimmy Carter went over and secured his release, P.J. Crowley uh, tweeted, uh, warning to Americans thinking about traveling to North Korea, we have a limited supply of former presidents, <laughs> um, which I thought was wonderful. Um, um, I also thought it was very interesting the way he talked about uh, how when he comes in in the morning, he gets a, a stack of clips. Uh, he gets two stacks of clips. One is of uh, the, the way the rest of the world has covered America. Uh, but the other, the first stack that he mentioned was an inch-thick stack of clips about uh, U.S. media coverage of U.S. foreign policy. And I was fascinated to discover that it's actually an inch high because I can't imagine that it would be. Um, and I'm sure either it was much higher, uh, much thicker in the past, um, or they're padding that dramatically because I think one of the most important things that he talked about today, um, one of the little nuggets he said was about the, the lack of uh, the reduction in journalists, U.S. journalists, uh, that he has at his briefings. And it really goes uh, part and parcel with what I want to talk about very briefly in these introductory comments, which is that uh, a couple of things. One is the trend in U.S. media coverage of foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy in general, and especially U.S. media coverage of the rest of the world, uh, a trend, a declining trend in both cases, a, a decline in the amount of coverage, the quantity of coverage, and I would argue the quality of coverage. Um, and that's for a number of, of different reasons. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, ways in which this is a very interesting time to be talking about this subject in particular, because even though the news industry is shrinking, uh, the traditional news media industry is uh, said to be shrinking in many ways, the decline in papers, uh, et cetera. Um, in other ways, that's an interesting time because there are alternative means of not only gathering news and producing news. Someone mentioned ProPublica uh, during the question and answer. Um, but also uh, blogs and the internet and other types of backpack reporting, as it's called, and, and ways in which there are alternatives not only for mainstream journalists to gather news if they so choose, uh, but also other avenues for the rest of us to get our news uh, for young journalists in the room from SNPA and, and for others uh, to uh, report on the news. Uh, but also ways uh, to do reporting, basic reporting, uh, ways for organizations that want to get news out, that want to maybe challenge official lines um, of argument uh, to get that news to reporters. So that's an interesting time, whether all those uh, potentialities are realized or not. Um, first of all, I want to just uh, talk about these, uh, these trends towards declining news and, and the nature of U.S. media coverage of foreign policy and, and the world. And really the short uh, way of putting this is that the best way to understand the way the U.S. covers the world and covers foreign policy is to understand U.S. foreign policy, that U.S media coverage of both subjects typically uh, has been found over the years uh, to reflect U.S. foreign policy, and particularly uh, the way elites talk about U.S. foreign policy. So the, uh, a, a brief way to, to think about that uh, is uh, a few studies have looked at, say, coverage of 
um, of Darfur and, and related topics uh, in Sudan before, uh, say, the, the beginning of the 21st century, or uh, I think even more critically, uh, the regional conflict centered around the uh, DRC, um, and have found, that, for instance, that you get uh, basically no coverage in the American media, and then you get these spikes. So if you were looking at a line chart over time, it would go like this, and you get these little heartbeat spikes. And you, you look into the spikes, and you find, well, what, what was happening there? So there's two pieces of news there. One is no coverage, and the other is the spike. Well, the explanation for the spike is inevitably because uh, some U.S. senior U.S. official, a secretary of state uh, in the case of the 90s, uh, or somebody else, uh, decided to mention it, go there, uh, or, or do something like, uh, like that, which was always an episodic event. Uh, they would make a visit, they would mention it prominently in a briefing, or a State Department spokesperson would mention it. Um, or there might be some episodic crisis uh, that happened in a moment. As opposed to an ongoing crisis, there's an episodic moment of something, a, a particular uh, tragedy that happened, or something like that. Um, and that's what explains those spikes. Usually, though, what it was was something about a U.S. official did something, right? And that's really one, I think, uh, one of the really important ways to understand U.S. media coverage of foreign policy is that it typically reflects what the U.S. government is doing. So places that the U.S. government cares about are far more likely to get covered uh, than places the U.S. government doesn't care about, which, by the way, is a very different thing than saying places that are truly deserving of coverage and are important and that we need to know about get covered, right? That isn't necessarily the same thing. Um, this is a, a, a problem, if you will, that is accentuated uh, really since the, the mid-80s and certainly into the 90s as we see declines in news budgets and contraction in general in the traditional media industries, especially on broadcast television and the newspapers, because you no longer have, first of all, you no longer have the budget to cover the world the way that uh, traditional news organizations used to. Um, there is uh, also changes in the way that the industry um, is run that makes it uh, much more important that the news, say, on television generates a profit, which is, wasn't traditionally the case before the early 80s. Uh, and therefore, news organizations can't uh, just sit there and tolerate losing money on news the way that, uh, the way that they used to for a long period of time. Um, and so what goes? Well, one of the first things to go is the most expensive type of news there is in many ways, other than maybe, invest maybe investigative reporting, which is foreign news. It's very expensive to sustain a bureau, uh, particularly to sustain a bureau with multiple reporters and other assorted staff and camera people, et cetera, for thinking about television. So you cut those things. Okay, so what you end up getting is, um, say, one reporter, uh, and this is maybe out of newspaper, one reporter covering Africa. And so we have sort of the Sarah LaPayla model where Africa is a country, right? And you have... You never said that. You may, right. You may still have several reporters um, covering Europe, right? We get a very Eurocentric version of, uh, of, of the world uh, in American media coverage. But the point is, is that as budgets contract, you get much less coverage, right? And so you get what P.J. Crowley uh, is describing about his press briefings. Now, that's problematic on a, on a number of levels for anyone who thinks that the world's an important place, but I think Colin Powell actually uh, had a good example of, of why this matters, but also a strategy for getting around it that some U.S. officials sometimes take. One of the really important ways to understand this, this phenomenon is to understand that the way that elites in America think about the world, not just the places they think of as being important, but the way that they think about those places is also the way in which or is going to be reflected in U.S. media coverage, okay? So in other words, the frames that elites have for the rest of the world are going to be are far more likely to be the frames used by foreign policy reporters and, and others in the U.S. media. So when Colin Powell was, uh, uh, Colin Powell was very concerned about what was happening with uh, the HIV AIDS crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. And this was a, a subject that was very difficult to get coverage of. And so one of the things that he did, and he, it's not like he made this up, it was, it was a, something that was true and, and is still true and very important to him and others, was he started talking about the problem of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa as, um, as a national security problem. And this was before 9-11. He was talking about this is a problem about failed states, and failed states are places that produce terrorists. And so we need to worry about this, not only on a humanitarian level, but in the United States, we actually have a, he was arguing, we have a national interest 
in worrying about this topic. This isn't just about being do-gooders, as if there's anything wrong with that, uh, but there really is, from a realistic perspective, there is a reason to be concerned about this from a perspective of American foreign policy, that if, if we have failed states, if we have all these sorts of problems, that this is going to breed terrorism and make the world less safe for us, make it less stable for us to conduct trade, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an argument that had uh, indifferent effects on the U.S. media in terms of its coverage, but it's a strategy uh, that sometimes elites can use effectively to get a subject that otherwise is not going to be likely to be covered very often uh, uh, to be covered, is to frame it in a certain way uh, that is more consistent with a traditional way in which U.S. foreign policy is conducted, right, is it in our interest, uh, but also in a way that is consistent with the way the U.S. media typically frames things. I mentioned at the outset that this is an interesting time to be talking about a subject like this because of uh, new media and its uh, cross pressures and, and but also its potential um, additions uh, or, or ways in which the, the media can use it. Um, and this is an open question. There isn't an easy answer here. People who say that, uh, oh, new media are liberating and, and the Twitter revolution and all that are, are really way ahead of themselves. Uh, we don't actually know, I think, very much uh, about that on the global scene. We have a, maybe a better sense of it in, in America, but I'll let Matt address that since he's the expert on it. Uh, but on a global scene, um, uh, it's, it's far less clear uh, the role of new media uh, in general in the various ways that we talk about them in terms of collective action and challenging authority. But in terms of the news business, it's a very interesting challenge because on the one hand, as has been mentioned before, it's putting pressure on traditional media as an industry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it also opens doors in a declining uh, environment for foreign news in the U.S., it creates alternative avenues for, first of all, cheaply produced foreign news uh, that can be used by traditional media and others, uh, but also it creates at least the opportunity for alternative means for the rest of us to get news uh, about the rest of the world that we might be interested in, and at least in theory, uh, the opportunity to find news about topics uh, that challenge official lines, whether that's the official line in Iran or London or here. Um, and so that's a very interesting uh, development that we have to uh, sort of see uh, come about. I don't want to hog the whole time here. I know we want to have mostly discussion, but I yes, think those are sort of the, yeah. the ways in which I would lay out the, dis the sort of framework here. Good, thank you. Perhaps we could move on to Arno de Borgard. Uh, with apologies for the laryngitis that I woke up with this morning. Uh, Saul Bellow once said that a great deal of intelligence can be invested in, in ignorance when the need for illusion runs deep. And uh, today, I think we're living the illusion of a well-informed citizenry. <clears throat> in my 62 years in the news business, I'm about to enter my 85th year, uh, I've gone from the Morse code and key to telex to satellite phones, wireless laptops, which is what I used during the Battle of Tora Bora in December of 01 when we failed to nail Osama bin Laden. But all those bells and whistles, in my judgment, have not uh, improved our understanding of the world around us. In fact, that understanding has diminished perceptibly, aggravated at rec by rec in recent times by uh, our crisis in journalism that we're all talking about. The average age of a newspaper reader, I've read recently, is 55. Many newspapers are dying uh, or born again online. Tech-savvy bloggers have already revolutionized politics yet again, though I hear that might be changing too from Reggie. And some, of course, would argue not for the better. And Twitter, following YouTube, MySpace, Facebook, and many others caused a near revolution in Iran two summers ago. But the quality and quantity of foreign reporting for American publications has declined, in my judgment, precipitously. Foreign bureaus, as you've heard, have been closed. Prominent foreign correspondents have taken buyouts or started their own blogs. Uh, and in my judgment, Americans have seldom been as ill-informed about global trends and crises as we are today. Frequently, our three major networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, do not carry a single item of foreign news, even though one of them calls, them, calls itself uh, World News Tonight, which reinforces my conviction that TV is to news what bumper stickers are to philosophy. <laughs> As The Economist summarized the media crisis, many <laughs> newspapers and television producers have discovered that people have short attention spans and a hunger for scandal, gossip, and disgust. They feed them accordingly, often below the belt, by bugging telephones and badgering celebrities. 
We now have a new journalism, the journalism of assertion, which has replaced the journalism of verification, which I was trained with, beginning with United Press in London in 1946. With 24-7 news cycles, we have neglected our duty to arouse public interest where it did not exist before, and to take what's important and make it interesting. As a result, few democratic leaders today seem to grasp that we're living through a period of social change that is more profound than anything we've experienced in, in 5,000 years of recorded history, and all of that is now on fast forward. There are, of course, exceptions, Al Jazeera being a notable one. Its coverage of the world's most important stories outshines, in my judgment, all other reputable sources. I watch it every day, morning and evening. In the Gulf recently, I was reading the Peninsula News and the Gulf News. Each one of those newspapers carried 12 pages of foreign news. The Financial Times and the International Herald Tribune are now the very best newspapers in the English-speaking world. They are first among the seven newspapers that I read every morning. I believe the root of my criticism stems from the situation as we emerged triumphant from the Cold War. Editors and TV producers decided in their infinite wisdom that Americans no longer cared about foreign news and decided to focus instead on easier to cover, certainly less expensive to cover, domestic stories. That gave us two years of O.J. Simpson. Uh, the infamous skater, Tonya Harding, according to a detailed study done by the Pew Foundation, got more airtime in a comparable news period than the fall of the Berlin Wall. There are many such examples, as you know. Superb reporting was done on the Iraq war until it became too expensive to cover, including the high maintenance of life insurance in a combat zone, which in some cases was $1,000 a day. 9-11 woke us up again from the deep sleep about the world beyond Iraq, but Al-Qaeda and its associated movements is a tough and very expensive war to cover. Below, below the radar screen that stretches from the west coast of Africa to Algeria, to Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, and back to Pakistan. Very difficult to cover. I'm now at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and we've just started a massive study of AQ, Al-Qaeda, AM, and associated movements. That'll take about six months. Al-Qaeda radicalization from Stockholm to Madrid to Minneapolis is taking place on the internet, where a global caliphate in cyberspace provokes a much more exciting view of the future than life in a rundown Muslim suburb of Paris or Birmingham in England. So those are the problems as I see them today <coughs> at, my at the advancing age of 85 <coughs> and having spent 62 years in this nutty profession called journalism. Well, no, thank you very much. I, I don't think we're going to get a, such a sweeping viewpoint from uh, anyone else of our... Um, 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 panel here. I, I, I would like to add, I think, another reason why Iraq coverage diminished was when the United start, States started doing better in the war. Uh, there was more of, of the coverage seemed more appealing when the United States was Well, when you look at the situation today, badly. there should be massive coverage than today, since now the power with the most influence in Iraq is not the United States, but Iran. Yes, but that, that's... Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But, uh, so that's the, 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 a very big story. Is, they're not having a set-piece battle, unfortunately. Or fortunately, perhaps, I should say. Um, anyway, uh, next in line is uh, Robert uh, Adman. Bob. Thank you. Uh, I took it as my, uh, <clears throat> my instruction to uh, talk to uh, those of you in the audience who are foreign correspondents, uh, <clears throat> trying to figure out American politics and American media, um, about this question of w w media bias. And it's already been alluded to by almost everyone uh, uh, who's spoken so far. And I guess I'm gonna provide a slightly different uh, uh, point of view on that. Uh, I think that in the mainstream uh, media that remain the most important sources for news for the people who uh, are influential, that is the New York Times, the Washington Post, the network news shows, the AP Wire, Time in Newsweek still, I think, uh, National Public Radio, CNN. Uh, most of the reporters' uh, uh, coverage is not structured by a desire to uh, push the coverage in the direction that they personally uh, might favor. 
Uh, I think they, they try very hard to uh, offer a consistently nonpartisan, reasonably balanced and fair reporting uh, of the political process. So if you go to any of those media, I think you'll, you'll get something like that, uh, or at least that's what they're trying to do. Um, but uh, what my research is showing is that uh, despite this commitment to balance, on any given issue, uh, the media are quite likely to be uh, out of balance and to, to strongly favor one side of a controversy, to strongly favor one uh, candidate or uh, party position. Um, typically, this is traced to uh, their personal beliefs and this idea that, you know, I, I'm, I'm being favorable to Barack Obama because uh, I'm a liberal. And I think that that really can't be sustained by, by the evidence. Um, uh, so what I'm saying is, is a slightly more nuanced argument is that, yes, indeed, the media will frequently be very one-sided in covering controversies, but it's not because of the journalist's personal views. Uh, usually, the, uh, there are several other forces that are shaping uh, that uh, slanted coverage. Uh, most importantly, there's a constant battle between the Republican and Democratic parties. That's the heart, at really the heart of American political discourse and one of the most important places where the, the two parties and their politicians and officials like P.J. Crowley place, place their time. And that, that is to try to get the media to skew in favor of their position. So that's what the Republicans and Democrats are trying to do. They're trying to <coughs> push the coverage in one direction or another. And mm -hmm. if it does push in one direction or another, which I would argue it frequently does, um, that more than anything else, there are several factors, but more than anything else suggests that one of the parties is doing a better job at spinning the news. And uh, they get away with it for a variety of reasons, even though the journalists, the reporters themselves, not so much the columnists, but the reporters, uh, are trying to provide something that's balanced and fair. Um, so uh, let, let me give you just uh, an example that I think is telling. Uh, I could give you many, many. Um, if you look at the coverage of the U.S. presidential election in 2008 in the, uh, the fall campaign, uh, from late September through Election Day, it strongly favored Barack Obama. It was very favorable to Barack Obama and very negative for uh, McCain. However, in the first three weeks of the fall campaign, it was extraordinarily favorable to the Republican ticket, mostly because of Sarah Palin, who got extremely favorable coverage and uh, very unfavorable to the Democrats. Now, there are reasons for this having to do with the incompetent Democratic uh, orchestration of their convention, rel uh, which happened at the beginning of this period, relative to the actually, uh, at least for a certain point in time, the brilliant political strategy of McCain in choosing this electrifying new figure who would predictably generate lots of copy, lots of interest, lots of attention. Joe Biden got almost no coverage. Um, he was predictable. He was, you know, everyone in Washington knew him. There was no news there. Palin was news, and she got a lot of positive coverage for a few weeks. Uh, and that completely swamped the Democrats. So if, if you look over the period of this, these two months, you have a, a swing from a very one-sided pro-Republican to a very one-sided pro-Democratic coverage. That, I would argue, is not atypical, even though the journalists themselves are trying to balance out the coverage. And what they might say is, well, if you average the early part and the late part, you come up with something like balance. I don't think that's quite right. Uh, but uh, my main point is to convey to those of you who aren't maybe familiar with the American uh, media that this is what's going on. How do you, how do you uh, uh, challenge that or, or get beneath it? Uh, uh, I would say uh, one is to constantly look for your own data. So when they're telling you, for example, um, uh, here's a good current example, that uh, the, the Republicans are going are gonna, to uh, swamp the Democrats in the, in the uh, election race next month, uh, you can go and look at the public opinion data yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to listen to these spinmeisters telling you that. Even if spinmeisters, in this case, on both sides, 
both Democrats and Republicans tend to be spinning this. The Democrats are sort of minimizing the heavy losses, the Republicans are maximizing them, but there's other data out there that might say something different. So be independent of the people who are trying to create that slanted news and often succeed in creating the slanted news despite the best efforts of the uh, journalists. In my view, I think that's what's going on with mainstream journalism. Okay. <coughs> that's it? That's it. I'm kidding. <coughs> Good. You told me five well, minutes. Yes. I, I, that, that, I couldn't, Wasn't that pithy uh, enough? It was pithy. Absolutely okay. wonderfully pithy. pithy. you off? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is that if pithy like that, you get your message across. Yes. Um, uh, Matt. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Reginald. Uh, my name is Matt Heinemann. I'm a professor here okay. at the uh, School of Media and Public Affairs. Uh, and I've been invited along, I believe, to, uh, to talk a little bit more about the online news environment and the online public <clears throat> sphere uh, in the United States. Um, so I want to I suggest to you today um, that in many ways the online, for we've, we've heard a lot today about how chaotic and how new and how dynamic the online environment is. I want to suggest that that's largely wrong. Or at least that's not true at the top, and that's not true in terms of the sources that people are actually reading. Um, uh, we heard PJ talk about um, about how the how the fundamental issue of the uh, of, of of politics, well, maybe that's too strong. Fundamental issue in terms of the media scape is the expansion of the number of outlets, and that's generally true. Um, but in many ways, the internet is really an extension of something that has been going on, of course, for quite a while. Um, you know, and I think that it's easy for particularly reporters, but also for members of the public, for politicians, for interest groups, um, to look at the changes and make the, draw the wrong conclusion. So just a couple of years ago at a very similar event to this, Brian Williams, who's anchor of NBC, said, uh, well, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, I apologize if I'm not going to get the quote right, lot, quite right, but he said, you know, all my life, you know, I've been, str I've been struggling, trying to get credentials to cover my line of work, mm -hmm. and now I'm competing with a guy named Vinny who lives in an efficiency apartment in the Bronx, and he hasn't left that efficiency apartment in years. I want to suggest to you that that gets blogs and, and, uh, and the, the, blo the phenomenon of blogs exactly backwards, right? So I want to use my time uh, today mostly to talk about what online news consumption actually looks like. Um, so let's start out with, um, so what portion of America's online media diet, what portion of web visits go to news outlets? Actually, not that much. Only about 3 or 4% of web visits um, go to online news outlets. Um, but if we restrict our, restrict our search, right, restrict the question just to non-commercial or online-only outlets, the sort of outlets that aren't just an online outpost of a traditional media organization. Um, the amount of actual web traffic that, to, that goes to those kind of outlets, um, on, you know, uh, online-only news outlets, uh, 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 interest group sites, uh, anything that doesn't fall into the category of a traditional news organization, is only about two-tenths of a percent. Right? It's really a rounding error. Um, that's not to say that it's not important in certain circumstances, um, but we shouldn't confuse this with something that is a mass phenomenon uh, sweeping uh, the republic. Um, so are people getting more of their news diet online? Yes, I, I don't think there's any question. Um, but at the same time, um, it's also clear that a much more important part of the American news diet comes from television, and even, yes, still from network news, than comes from, uh, from, from the online world. Um, our ways of measuring this aren't perfect. One of the, uh, one of the, one of the best long-term measures we have comes from questions that are asked um, by Pew um, in their um, uh, Center for the, for the People in the Press. Uh, and they ask, uh, they've asked since uh, for 20 years, um, what portion of, uh, what, what are your, what are your most, what's your most important source of news? And if they give one, they say, well, okay, well, where's, where, what's your next most important source of news? And now, um, as, as I believe Reginald mentioned, we're now finally up to the point where more people say that online news is more important to them than, uh, than a traditional newspaper, right? Um, but that's still behind all of these other outlets. It's still far behind television, which is 70, 75, 80% of the public um, says that that's an important source of news to them. Um, not a, but even though people say that increasingly the, uh, the web is an important source of news, um, it's important to understand exactly how they're using this 
uh, how, they're, how they're using this source, and actually when they're using this source. Uh, most visits to news sites, online news sites, are quite short. Um, and they kind of have to be short because they're during the working hours. Most news consumption, uh, yeah, online news consumption especially, is not like... It's not like reading the newspaper. It's not like uh, watching TV news. It's, it's an activity that's done primarily at work. And for those of you who are working in news organizations, uh, I'm sure that you get, the, you, know, get, you get the heat maps, you get the internal <coughs> reports um, that, tell, that, that suggest that this, is, that this is the phenomenon that you're seeing. Um, so um, I think that it's also we need to be careful uh, in terms of interpreting what it means to say that news consumption is up. And I generally think that, you know, by, by some metrics, that's actually true. But the broader phenomenon that we've seen in American, uh, in, the, in, in the American media, uh, and frankly, in the American public sphere over the past 20 years, is that um, it's less about a change in the mean than a change in the variance. That is, what happens when you get something like CNN? Well, it turns out that some people really like news. So they're going to watch news all day long, right? And most of the rest of the public uh, is going to uh, instead watch other things, watch sports, um, you know, watch uh, you know, whatever the latest USA drama is, right? watch uh, you know, whatever's on the family channel. Right? Um, and so what you've seen is not so much a change in the mean, but a, just a, a dramatic um, a differentiation and more inequality in terms of how much news Americans consume and how much uh, Americans know about Politics, and that shapes, uh, and that shapes the that, that shapes the, the concrete economics of news in powerful ways. Um, it, it, instead of instead of being geared, uh, instead of being geared primarily at the mass market, you can see certain segments of media that are geared much more towards niche segments of the public. Uh, and I'll be talking, uh, 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 I'll, I'll be talking more about that later. But that shows up particularly in terms of the, uh, of questions about polarization. Um, certainly, the economics of the online media market um, promote polarization and promote, uh, in general, uh, many of these outlets uh, that do have stronger views. This, again, is not a new phenomenon. When Ben Franklin moved and set up his, the second newspaper in Philadelphia, um, his market was to be, well, essentially more of an 18th century tabloid. It was trashy, it was, it was flamboyant, it was well-written, uh, and it got a lot of attention, right? And it was anti-establishment. Right? And I think you can see that those same kind of economics at work online. Um, but I also want to suggest, uh, I think one of the most fundamental misconceptions about online news is that online news is deeply decentralized. Right? Um, we hear all this talk about uh, bloggers and, and people are going to all these tiny little news outlets. Um, now, it's certainly more decentralized than, say, the American news market was in the Cronkite era. Um, but actually, online news is dramatically more concentrated in many ways than print newspaper readership, which is the area of media consumption that has been most directly affected by the rise of the internet. The top 10 outlets online account for almost a third of all online news readership, whereas the top 10 newspapers in the US account for about 20% of print readership. Um, at the same time, if you, you can, in fact, look at the long tail of online content. Um, sites that are tiny in terms of market share, say sites that are ranked below 500 uh, in terms of their total audience, are about 20% of the total American news consumption online. Um, whereas newspapers that are ranked below 500 only, are only about 3% of the print circulation in the US. So instead of this simple story, this simple narrative about how everybody's going to the tiny outlets, in fact, more people are moving to the very biggest outlets than are moving to the smallest. Um, uh, a couple more points before I uh, finish up. Um, so even though we have all these online, a uh, greater diversity of online outlets, <coughs> um, does that mean that we have more diverse content? Um, to some extent, the jury's still out on this, but uh, the early reports, early re recent research, suggests that the answer is actually no, and partly for reasons that we've already heard about today. It used to be very difficult for, uh, during, certainly during the middle of the news cycle, for news organizations to d get a really good job, to do a really good job of monitoring what their competitors were doing. Now it's almost impossible to avoid. And so in a variety of contexts, you see more duplication of, of stories. Um, in, in, many, in, in, uh, in, in terms of the, the herd mentality, the echo chamber, in ways that we're, uh, we're familiar with. Um, and let me, suggest, let me conclude by talking a little bit about blogs. Um, 
I don't want to suggest, I'll make a grand statement. I think blogging is dead. In fact, um, I think that the, to the extent that you could talk about blogging as in the, in the, in the ways that you, that, that you often heard blogs discussed in 2000, 2003, uh, blogs as citizen-generated uh, uh, citizen media. Um, I think if, if you, in that sense, blogs really never existed in the first place. Um, in reality, when you start looking at the backgrounds of these uh, these organizations that were found, that these pop, <coughs> these blogs that uh, that were founded in 2001, 2002, or even earlier, um, you have a bunch of well, gosh, Ivy edu Ivy educated white guys talking about how blogs are empowering ordinary people like them, right? <laughs> um, and in fact, that's quite true, right? Where really blogs really were, uh, you know, there were that really were at that particular moment, it was relatively cheap um, to start a blog. I think it's quite clear um, that to actually be read as a blogger that that moment has passed. If you look at the 2001-2002 uh, election cycle, there was a lot of new blogs. 2003-2004, a few, a few of them got really big. 2005-2006, only a couple. In the 2007-2008 cycle, there was only one new blog that made it into the list of top 100 political sites uh, over the course of the 2007-2008 campaign. Anyone want to guess what it was? 538. 538.com, right. And, and not only that, this is a very mm -hmm. different model of blog uh, initiation, right? It was started out as sort of a spin-off of Daily Coast, not uh, as a sort of a one-man band site initially. Uh, and of course, what we now see is that blogging isn't a separate category of content. It's just a subgenre of opinion journalism. And it's done overwhelmingly by professional journalists. Uh, 538, you know where Right, yeah. Now, 538, of course, is now, uh, has now been, you know, is now providing content uh, for the website of the New York Times. Uh, and I think this has dramatic implications for how we read things like blogs. Um, what is a blog? Well, now it's just the default way of publishing any sort of time sensitive information online. Um, and so the ways in which we evaluate sources um, really depend uh, particularly on, in much, are, are, are still in the online world quite traditional. Um, and, we, and, uh, and, I think that that, uh, and I think that that is good news for the reliability of blogs, um, but probably uh, contradicts a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the narratives that we still hear uh, about uh, guys in efficiency apartments in the Bronx and how, that they're, ta how they're taking over journalism. Um, I, think it's, I think we need to be very careful um, not to be too self-aggrandizing. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think that was quite fascinating. I would just ask, would like to ask you one point of clarification. Sure. You're talking about going for news online and going to newspapers as if those were two contrasting uh, separate uh, ways of getting news. But aren't a lot of people going to the online sites of newspapers? I mean, to newspaper websites? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how, how does that affect your statistics? Um, so if you look at what are, the, what are the most read online news outlets, they are all familiar names. Um, they are Yahoo, Yahoo News. Um, CNN.com, the New York Times, and on and on, you know, uh, you know, NBC, NBC, on and on down the list. Uh, these are these are generally traditional outlets, um, with some exceptions, like like Yahoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And now, um, finally, to a European practitioner uh, of the art of the foreign correspondent from Washington, uh, Gina. Thank you. Yes, I'm a correspondent with the. Uh, Swedish radio, <clears throat> and I might as well begin by, by declaring I am completely dependent on U.S. media as a correspondent. Uh, I would like to, to confirm what Frank Cessno said in his opening remarks. Uh, I re-report a lot of stuff. I, I report what American media has already reported about, and that's part of my job. Uh, so I would be nothing without you. Let me <laughs> begin by declaring that. Um, I've been with the Swedish radio for 20 years. <clears throat> the, the last 15 years I've been covering mostly global and, and foreign news. Um, <clears throat> I've been reporting from, from the Middle East, from all over Europe. I've been covering the, the latest three presidential elections here uh, in the US, and I've been, been uh, appointed Washington Corris correspondent 2007, so I have been based here, uh, living here in, in Washington uh, for the last three years. And um, in other words, I've seen the changes uh, that many American newspapers and many America, American media outlets have gone through the last years and that, that you all have been talking about. 
uh, with layoffs in, in the newsrooms, with cutbacks that have resulted in thinner papers and, and less resources. Uh, we have gone through the same thing in Sweden and, and all over Europe, as you know. But I must say, in, in comparison with uh, other parts of the world that I've been covering, I still find American journalism to be outstanding. Um, we all know there are huge differences between different media outlets, between uh, uh, d different newspapers. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions and all sorts of, of variations. Um, but overall, when I open New York Times in the morning, when I read Wall Street Journal, USA Today, uh, when I listen to NPR, I'm, I'm deeply impressed by, by the knowledge, by the uh, ambitious and by the thorough uh, reporting uh, that are being presented here each and every day. Uh, just this past weekend, the, the story in, in Washington Post about uh, soldiers coming home from Afghanistan with, with brain injuries. I mean, did you see the article? It was, it was a great story. And uh, the story in New Yorker about uh, how, how the Senate and the White House missed to make a deal on climate change. Uh, that's what I call good journalism. Um, so I want to begin by expressing my gratitude. <laughs> Uh, my gratitude towards many U.S. media outlets, and, and I'm in awe of, of a lot of things you do. Uh, with that being said, Reggie, you asked me to talk about the pitfalls uh, yes. of, of relying on U.S. media outlets, and there are quite a few. Um, one pitfall for a foreign correspondent is the risk to buy into uh, the American view of the world too much. Uh, it's easy to get, uh, to get used to defects in one owns home, and I think that there are some issues, some subjects that American journalists overall don't report on as much as one could expect. Uh, one example is the capital punishment. Uh, I mean, there are certain cases of, of uh, execution that gets a lot of attention, like recently the, the woman in, in Virginia uh, who was executed, but overall, why isn't there a nationwide debate going on about the capital punishment? Uh, why isn't there a debate in the media every week about the fact that U.S. still uses the death penalty? From a European point of view, from a European perspective, uh, that's astonishing. Um, the death penalty was also a non-existent issue in the presidential election. I don't think the candidates were asked a question about it. Uh, and that's also surprising for... for uh, European correspondent. Um, another such issue is Guantanamo uh, and the, deten the other detention centers around the world that, that US has abroad. Um, there is reporting about certain trials, but overall, again, from a European perspective, perspective, where is the sort of constant coverage? Where are the constant questions about what's going on there? And why aren't there, again, articles every week about the fact that U.S. holds prisoners year after year without prosecution. Um, in, in my job as a correspondent, I should both try to reflect the, the debate going on in U.S., uh, report about what is being reported here, um, but also try to keep my, my Swedish or my European uh, glasses, uh, our perspective. Uh, in the sense that we need to, as foreign correspondents, see and point out uh, things that are different and things that are happening but that are not being covered as much. So my advice to foreign cor correspondents would, would be uh, to always keep an eye on the underreported stories as well. Another possible pitfall is, is um, what some of you already has mentioned, the trend toward more opinionated uh, journalism that is obvious to me um, in, in US right now. And you see it most obviously maybe on Fox News, but, but also on MSNBC. Um, and as uh, Jamie McIntyre, uh, the former CNN correspondent, he, he, he was interviewed at Reliable Sources at CNN yesterday, and he said, <coughs> Uh, we see a journalism that is more in interested in inflaming the public, um, the public opinion than informing the public opinion. And that is certainly the, the case with, with certain media outlets, I think. 
Uh, Fact-checking is, is always important, but with this trend toward more opinionated news, it's even more important. Fact-checking is more important than ever. Another obvious pitfall, uh, the news cycle is so fast, the, the speed. The 24-7 news cycle is, is wonderful for us news junkies, but, but it's also uh, a risk, as we all know. And, and there's a tendency to, uh, especially in cable news uh, channels, to over-dramatize and to focus on events rather than uh, facts and analysis. And, and I just have to mention the balloon boy, right? We all, <laughs> we all know what we're talking about. And, and for me, it's a problem and a blessing sometimes, but, but sometimes a problem that my editors back in Stockholm watches CNN 24-7, and, and they follow those events, and, and they call me and, and think that there's a drama going on, and, and sometimes I have to argue with them to, to be able to go out and do my own interviews about a completely different topic than the balloon boy. Um, we didn't report about that much about the balloon boy, but yes, we got caught <laughs> in the drama as well. Um, it's easy to get seduced by a story like, like that one, where, where you see a balloon in the sky with a, possibly with a little boy in it. And uh, there is an obvious risk that we as correspondents and as, as foreign correspondents get caught up in the day-to-day -day drama instead of doing deeper analysis and instead of seeing the big picture. Um, I have to mention one other, one other possible pitfall. I think as, as, foreign, as a foreign correspondent and maybe especially as a, as a European uh, journalist, I think that I need and we need to be extra careful and extra watchful when it comes to our own biases towards the US. Uh, American politics is something else. And, and we as Europeans uh, tend to, uh, I mean, let's be honest, we, mainstream European politics have more in common with President Obama's views than with President, former President Bush. And, and it's, it's a huge risk for biases there from our side. And we should be watchful of that. And, and if we do want to do fair reporting about American politics, we really need, need to make an effort to mirror both sides and both parties in, in a fair and respectful way and to be aware of our own European prejudices. Thank you. Well, you certainly brought a, a, a your Swedish and European perspective to us, uh, particularly by choosing those two subjects, Guantanamo and mm -hmm. uh, the death penalty, which are issues which are throughout Europe are subjects that, that people constantly think about when they mm -hmm. think about the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's true to say, one of my American colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's true to say that no... <coughs> American presidential candidate has ever campaigned against the death penalty. I think they've all, every single one has been in favor, except possibly John Kerry, who at one point. was against it. Was he against it? Uh -huh. Yes, but it's, it's very, very rare. And, uh, well, you saw what happened. To exactly. <laughs> That's why nobody has been <laughs> since. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I think an, another point that, 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 that uh, is, is happening a bit with, with, with all this vast amounts of information that's all over the place is that actually editors are becoming more important right. um, because they have to decide which bits of these, uh, which stories they cover, which parts of this information they use. And, and that when, Bob, you talk about the, the writer not being, uh, or not thinking there, they're, they're prejudiced. I, I think we must remember that, that there's a huge function of the editor deciding on the, what to assign them, what not to cover, which is just as important as what to cover. I mean, it was quite remarkable the way a large part of the media here did not cover the Tea Party because they thought it, they didn't approve of it somehow or thought it would, hoped it would go away. I, I mean, the, 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 there are... The, the editors... Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, showing, in my view, that they often sh show, show um, a habit of, of deciding what the story is, uh, or the, the conclusion of the story is, and then 
ordering up the inquiry. It, it, it's, it's come a certain reversal from the traditional way of sending out the in, I think the literature is, is kind of interesting on your point about mm -hmm. how the U.S. media, and this is, I think, important for the people in the room, thinking about how the U.S. media cover uh, social movements in general uh, in the U.S. Um, and thinking about pitfalls and what we don't cover in the U.S. I mean, one of the real consistent findings in academic literature is that uh, the mainstream press uh, goes through predictable patterns in the way that it ignores and then eventually covers, usually in a sensationalistic manner, social movements on the left and the right. Um, and I think the Tea Party movement could fit that definition of a social movement by just about any uh, one's uh, definition. But we are, it's early in that process to, to have data on whether the, the pattern has been the same in the media coverage of it. But I think if we look at the, the history of U.S. coverage of social movements, it follows this pattern of ignoring them for a while, initially covering them in a very uh, predictable way in which they focus on violence, usually in a way that is not actually consistent with the reality of the movement, so in other words, exaggerating violence, uh, making them things like vandalism into violence, uh, mm. which are two different things. Um, and it takes a long time for the U.S. media, generally speaking, the mainstream media, to cover a social movement in some way that even remotely resembles uh, fairness. Um, and, and I think that the, the literature would say that that's true on the left and the right, social movements on the left yeah. and the right. So it's kind of an interesting well, thing. Well, I mean, think it's yeah. important, in fact, to understand that journalists are, uh, and this, I think, reflects Washington as well, uh, very distrustful of any form of mass political participation except yeah. voting. Yep. Uh, and, and, and truly, they don't think it's very legitimate. I, I studied, for example, the nuclear freeze movement, which was similar with, with uh, ig ignoring then uh, emphasizing the hippies and the guitars and all mm -hmm. that. The radical and, elements. And the radical elements. And, and then um, essentially uh, going back to ignoring when there weren't uh, kind of something going on as a march, when in fact, there was huge public support for their ultimate uh, goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and journalists just saw that and spoke of it in terms that were demeaning throughout the period. So um, uh, it, it, it's an interesting contradiction, I would say, in American political culture that we're always telling ourselves, and I don't know if this happens in Sweden, but we're always telling ourselves, we're the greatest country, we're the most powerful country, we're the freest country, we're the best democracy the world's ever seen. And yet when it comes down to it, uh, journalists and I would say generally the Washington political culture don't, don't really appreciate anything but uh, citizens kind of quietly casting a ballot. Yeah. Well, Robert, Sweden, you... Sweden, I should tell you, has been defined as a mor the moral superpower. Oh, so you have oh really? But, but not by ourselves, no. okay. because we're very <laughs> humble people. <laughs> have arrived. Let me put one, one more thing before we go to the floor. It, it, is that it's, it seems to me, as, uh, just as an observer of the, the media for a long time, that, that there's uh, been a huge growth in emotion in, in, in the media, as opposed to the what, where, why, when. That, that, uh, th th there was a point, perhaps, around 1990, where if you had it, you might have a huge train crash and, and somebody would come staggering out of the wreckage and if there was a journalist with a microphone, they'd put it in the face of the, the person coming out and so, uh, the first question would be, what happened? And now the question is, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's enormous, particularly on TV, uh, Mrs. Jones, how do you feel that, that your son uh, has just been convicted of being a serial uh, murderer? I mean, how do you think I'm she feels? I'm very proud. You know, I mean, <laughs> if you listen for it, it's there the whole time. Or how did you feel when? And, and to me, that's part of the sort of sub subjectivization of news that I think I see going on. Well, I think one of the phenomena that's related to that, perhaps, that we haven't, we've discussed I think on the outskirts today is the rise really since the, the early 80s and especially the early 90s of the celebritification of news. Uh, you mentioned the OJ uh, trial coverage uh, and, and Tony Harding. Um, but there's, there's a lot of good analysis, uh, especially of television, but also of print media, newspapers in an age of chain ownership, et cetera, and declining budgets of decisions made to shrink the news hole 
uh, in favor of, of course, advertising, but also just to shrink the news hole so you produce less newspapers and use less newsprint. Uh, and then on, on uh, television of shrinking the news hole to add ads and teasers so that people during your commercial don't change the channel and never come back because they found an exciting episode of Seinfeld or Friends or something. Uh, but the other thing is, is that the nature of news that fills the news hole is more likely to be uh, entertainment journalism or soft news, or human uh, interest. news you can use, yeah, human interest than hard news, and certainly more than foreign news, which of course is gone. Yeah. Now, we have some questions from the floor. <laughs> yes, could you step to the microphone and, and uh, identify yourself? Hi, um, I'm Matt Keller. I work for uh, the Embassy of Liechtenstein here in Washington. Um, my question is towards uh, the gentleman uh, regarding the sort of statistics, uh, Mr. Hinman, um, about um, the number of people who go to uh, uh, media online versus television. Um, and my question is, uh, as we've all been discussing as well, like the, the Swedish correspondent has been saying as well, she gathers information from all around the United States and, and sort of filters it and gives it, uh, reports it back to Sweden. I also see that kind of happening with the television media relying on the online media for their information. Uh, I've noticed that, for example, um, you know, if you want to know what's on the, going to be on the Today Show tomorrow, read a combination of the Huffington Post, the Drudge Report, Talking Points Memos, and the Daily Beast, and you'll find out 50% yeah. of what's on tomorrow's yeah. news. Yeah. And that's just sort of my point is that, you know, even though we can say 70% of people are watching television, the people that are reporting on television are, you know, getting their information online. Yeah, and I think that there's this, increasingly on cable news, you see this strange melding of, you know, this is what people are twittering about what I said five seconds ago, um, <laughs> which is kind of a strange variety of performance art, I guess I'd call it. Um, but I, yeah, I think that that's, I think that's exactly right. And I think that, um, uh, I think that you are also starting to see, well, I'll take a step back. I think it's worth, as important as cable news is, I think that it is important to remember that its absolute audience is actually quite small um, in terms of mid-hundreds of thousands of people in a nation of 300 million people. Um, so I think that um, uh, whereas Fox News may be important in a variety of ways, um, I think that in terms of uh, the number of, say, uh, independent voters uh, who are going to be swayed by what they see in Fox News, um, I'm going to guess, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that number is approaching zero. Uh, so the extent to which um, cable news in general uh, is important for that reason, I think, is, uh, I, I think it simply isn't. How do you see things working out with uh, the next 10, 20 years that more and more people are online? Around the world today, we have uh, four and a half billion uh, cell telephones. Uh, 6.8 billion people. We have uh, 2 billion people online. How does this all play out in the next 10 years? Uh, well, uh, normally I would defer to one of my colleagues, Steve Livingston, uh, on, on many of these questions. Um, I think that I think the answer is quite country specific. That the effects of the internet, the effects of mobile telephony, depend an awful lot on what the pre-existing conditions on the ground are. So it's, I think it's very hard to make a sweeping st statement uh, about you know, what this means for, for politics. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the US media, I think, that, I think there's a lot of people who sort of assume that we're going to continue to get less and less concentrated. Um, so for almost a, more than a decade now, uh, we've started to have these data on how uh, it turns out that online news is actually concentrated. And that can't be true, because we all know that the internet is democratizing. So let's wait a couple years, and it'll be, it'll be much less concentrated. In fact, uh, concentration levels have been pretty much absolutely stable uh, for a decade. Uh, and at this point, we're just waiting for Godot. Right. And know. how is the average person supposed to detect truth from disinformation, from misinformation? It seems to me that it's all become one uh, of the same kind of mix on, on uh, line and no differentiation between what is correct and what is incorrect. There are no editors online, and I know a lot, a lot of people get their news online. I, I think, I, I, but if, if you actually look at m most of these new outlets, like uh, the, one, the ones that do comparatively well, like the Huffington Post, they yeah. actually do have editors. Yeah. 
Um, and I think in, in some ways the most pernicious parts of things like the Huffington Post um, have to do with sort of an intensification of sort of um, phenomena that were already available before. So one of, the, one of my favorite uh, things about the Huffington Post is that the stories in the Huffington Post, if you read them, are pretty dull. But the headlines are often, I mean, <laughs> crazy. Uh, they could be pulled from, you know, any tabloid, you know, New York Post, uh, you know, whatever, right? Um, as it turns out, um, what's going on there? They're writing a bunch of different headlines for each of their different stories. And they're putting, for the first couple minutes that it's up, they see which of the headlines gets the most clicks. Um, and then they pick that one, and that becomes the real headline. Right? Well, um, Arianna Huffington's book is now called The Third World America, which is a, a very important subject. The more you travel around the world, the more you see how far we're falling behind yeah. in all sorts of areas. So I don't see too much uh, reporting of this in the, in the media, except when the pipes, the, the, the drain pipes in Washington are discovered to be over 100 years old, and suddenly there's a story. But this is happening all over the country. Yeah. Especially vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there, that's a good example of how the politicians are more important than the media, although yeah. there's an interaction. So you, you're not going to get much uh, help to your political career if you stand up and say explicitly, our infrastructure is deteriorating. We are now falling behind. We are weaker. That's not the message that uh, generally your consultants will tell you as a politician is, is a political winner. Well, actually, in the yeah. absence of that, <laughs> You have uh, uh, media coverage, which may be quite favorable toward building up the infrastructure and so on when on the few occasions they mention it, but it won't be part of the agenda because the, the politicians aren't making but it. But I, I think Obama did actually make that point with the stimulus plan. I, I, he did say, that, look, all, 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 we don't want all these green jobs and all, all the new developments to be in China. We, we have to spend money on, on our infrastructure. I th on, on, but, but, but that actually goes back to Sean's point, because how was that framed? That's as a national security issue, right? Um, I mean, and certain, cer I don't think there's any question that certain frames are favored, um, you know. Um, you know so, so I think it's a lot, you know, in some ways it's a lot easier to, uh, to get people interested in a, in a story with, you know, depending on the, on the frame that's offered with it. I think you'd, you'd really have a lot of trouble finding much in the way of the frame of, in the mainstream media, of a narrative of American decline, and we really need to focus on on uh, strengthening our scientific research and our infrastructure and so on. I mean, look at the current campaign. How, or how much are we talking about that versus how much, you know, we're talking about uh, the Christine O'Donnell's uh, witchery and so forth. <laughs> this, uh, you know, uh, um, anyway, the main point I wanted to make is that uh, if you're interested in what's in the media, and this is what uh, Shauna Day said as well, uh, it's really what the politicians are talking about. And the only caveat they're not I'd, talking about. The only caveat I'd make to, I guess, my own point, is that um, I think there's there's another way to understand American journalism, and that's to understand that it is produced by and reinforces American culture. And and then, so one way to under, another way to understand American journalism is to understand uh, American culture. And that's why I think the the project that you were talking about. Uh, Reginald, about where you guys take foreign correspondents and send them throughout America. I think that's a, a wonderful idea. Um, uh, not that you're going to find a definitive answer about what an American is, but you're going to find, like you would in any country, if I went to Sweden or anywhere else, uh, the diversity of, of viewpoints. But there are certain things about American culture. There are certain ways, um, certain norms uh, that are true, I think, about American culture. And in fact, some of the more landmark studies of American journalism have found that the kinds of biases we are most likely to find in American journalism aren't really ideological biases because those are so obvious journalists are sort of on guard against them, but more cultural norms like uh, um, a, a sense of individualism and, and things like that. But some of them include things like the sort of mythology that, that Bob's talking about that, um, that I think we all subscribe to. I know I do as an American that we're so awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, when you... All you have to do is fly through a European airport to realize how awesome you're not. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, the things that you're talking about, infrastructure, et cetera. And so, but those don't fit sort of not only what politicians are saying, but our own sense of ourselves uh, sometimes. And, and so I think thinking about American culture and what those values are is, is really important. I think that just reminds me of a point I wanted to make about uh, in, in bemoaning the decline of foreign news, one factor is the demand structure that the American 
consumer of news is laying out there, which is ethnocentric. You know, if the public were demanding, I really need to know what's going on in Congo and all that horrible stuff. I, I want to know all about it. You know, the media would provide it, but it's, it's a, we have a uniquely heavily market-driven uh, media system, much more so than in most of the other uh, affluent democracies. And, you know, that's the bad side of it, is mm -hmm. that, in fact, it is fairly responsive <clears throat> to the, the consumer taste, and when the consumer taste is ethnocentric and not terribly uh, interested in getting into the details of other countries, unless they happen to be a place where maybe we have a crisis conflict, and even then, the detail is fairly superficial. And America's then fairly provincial, can, too. We have yeah. two borders, and, yes. and one of them is Canada, which we don't count as a border. And, you know, so <laughs> it, it's hard for Americans to wrap their mind it's around a, it's the a world. We haven't had wars here at all. Yeah, I mean, there are many historical reasons, but I'm saying that it, all of this is rather predictable uh, just by an <clears> economist. <throat> But I mean, the consumer taste is also shaped by what you give yes. the consumer. So it's a so vicious it, circle. It's, it is a circle. And yeah, I mean, there is, there is, uh, there. Are, I think uh, certainly it's very convenient for editors to be able to say, "Oh, the Amer Amer audience is not interested in foreign mm -hmm. news, so we don't have to give it mm -hmm. to them." But if, in, in, in fact, if if you look at the research done by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. There's astonishing high percentages of Americans who say they are. I mean, 70%. It's, it's how you frame it. If, if the American yeah, media wanted to, but <laughs> it's so convenient for them to say, wow, isn't it great if people don't want us to do this very expensive exactly. reporting? Exactly. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 But from Reggie, Congo, right. Reggie, as a result of all of this, it seems to me that it's now glaringly obvious that there is a growing abyss between the geopolitical, geoeconomic, geostrategic, military, scientific, technological, and even psychological knowledge of the masses and their representatives on the one hand, and on the other, the knowledge that is absolutely indispensable to make logical, rational, and moral decisions. How, how do you anticipate the future if we're not going to be reporting about what is coming down the pike? Because politicians are certainly not, don't have enough time to do that. It's our job to do that and bring it all to their attention. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing that. Don't think if you look at foreign news and analyze what it is it, the Americans are getting, it's it's basically I think four categories: it's conflict, human interest, disasters, and sport. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and yeah. it's not uh, analysis of the sort of thing that Arno is talking about, or, or uh, how is the world going to be, and and what is America's role in it, and uh, and it does all of that episodically. As a result, dysfunctional government and dysfunctional Congress. Yeah, but I, I think I, I think the other the the other thing to keep in mind here, um, particularly for those of you who are correspondents covering the United States, is the shift um, in U.S. media, particularly the trend towards quote unquote hyperlocalism, um, which is more powerful in some areas than others, but I think that it's 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 certainly reshaped the news agenda at a lot of mid-sized metro. Dailies, which is an awful lot of the, uh, of, of, I mean, that's that that's that's the that, that's the like, the iron core of journalism in the United States is mid-sized metro daily newspaper reporters, um, and this uh, and the shifting economics has really uh, uh, has has really, you know, taken a lot of attention not just off the international stage but off the national stage as well. But I, I think there are also changes that have been uh, found in the way Americans. Um, um, go after their news. I mean, w w the, the way they, um, I'm, I'm not talking about the supply side of the yeah. news, but the way the demand side of the equation works. And, and there are some huge shifts, like with, with, with now that there are online, um, all this uh, information online, and, and uh, one is that a lot of the um, American consumption news is search led. That's to say that there's a subject they want, they've vaguely heard about and they want to follow up. Or, or they're curious about one thing, or they want to know the result of a football game, or they, so, so they go and Google something, and and pursue it that way, um, and so they're not getting a, a, a broad picture. Uh, it, the, the, you, was it you who talked about being in the office also and just sort of <laughs> quickly yeah. looking up? Uh, I, the, 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 yeah. This is grazing. I mean, I mean, the, 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 they often just read one headline in the first paragraph and then move on to the next. And this is totally the opposite to the traditional way of reading a newspaper, where you turn from page to page and read all the stories and learn about a whole yeah. lot of topics that, that you didn't know about before. Yeah. The, the, there's a, a lot of it comes from 
what you know and what you want to look for. And it's no, and I think I, I, I think that last point is definitely um, supported by uh, there's been a couple of, of studies that suggest exactly that that you know giving somebody a newspaper front page online uh, and giving somebody an actual newspaper. Uh, somebody who actually looks at a physical copy of the newspaper tends to be peripherally aware, tends to learn a little bit about a lot of things that they're just thumbing through. Um, and, and that perhaps that might be consequential. Uh, in terms of actually how people are getting to these online sites, it's true that a lot of it is search-led. But, an off, but, by, but by far the most important component of search-led is, is navigational searches, people searching for specific outlets. Um, so, you know, typing in the New York Times or Yahoo News mm -hmm. uh, or other or CNN into the search box. Um, so, I mean, it's it's you know it's a little silly sometimes. <laughs> Why don't you just put in CNN.com, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's easier. I uh, just put in CNN into the into the search box. Um, so, I think that you really do see people. So much of online news consumption uh, is habit driven. People go to the same sites today in general that they went to yesterday. Uh, and the importance of portals in a variety of senses online, it, I think, is really drives a lot of that behavior. Mm. But there's something you said before about uh, cable new TV news being only a small, small uh, the viewers not, not being a very large show. But, but there's a, one of the Pew figures I, I was looking at the other day said that actually 30, I don't know, it's 34, 36 percent of Americans say they get news from cable uh, cable TV news, so they d they do go there e even if they're not sitting sitting there looking at it all day. I, I have some other figures that are relevant, perhaps here. Um, the Pew asked the question of what did you do yesterday to get news as a sort of hypothetical day, and 34% uh, uh, said they went online for news. 58% um, said they went to TV, which bears out what you said. Only 17% say they uh, look for no news uh, in one particular day, which I think is remarkably uh, small. M maybe people don't always answer 100% um, honestly to these. Uh, people always <laughs> don't answer 100% <laughs> honestly. That's one thing right, we know. And then 26% uh, of Americans said they read a newspaper every day although only 8% of those under 30. And the average age is 55 and getting yeah. older. Yeah. I have a deputy at CSIS who's 40 years old, a brilliant young man, just turned 40. He's never read a newspaper in his life. Was that Tom? And he's proud of it. Yeah, Tom. Well, he's always in uh, Kyrgyzstan or something. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions for the audience? Yes. Could you come to the microphone? Hi, my name is Mark Etzold. I'm studying at American University, and um, I'm from Germany, so I have a question from a Euro European point of view um, about the Iraq war. Um, I think Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Crowley uh, already said in his keynote that uh, the U.S. media didn't do, you know, the best job seven years ago. Um, today we know that the former administration lied to us. Today we know. Um, that the media believed in these uh, lies. And um, we also know that this was some kind of um, rally around the flag effect that they um, thought that they have to be loyal. Uh, what do you think, um, sh what do you think uh, is the situation now? Did they realize what, what happened? Uh, did they learn something? or? In general, did the American society learn something about that event? Well, uh, I, think before I, may, may, I had a feeling <laughs> that the word lie was going to create some may, issues. May I, here. Matt, before we pass this to the panel, <laughs> I'd love to hear their views. I, I don't believe there is any proof that the administration lied, so you'd have to produce some evidence of that. Oh, okay, I would, I would uh, cite uh, Colin Powell, who said that the evidence he presented in front of uh, the United Nations Security Council were um, constructed. And, uh, that's, that's my evidence I would give you. How about if we do this, since I have a feeling we're going to have a row. Since we're in European audience, I'll say row. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we understand that. Row if, the boat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, it, 
It, instead of uh, the word lie, I think something we can agree on is that um, disinformation. Yes, that there there were uh, okay, I agree. faulty intelligence, stovepiped, etc. We can use all sorts of synonyms. Um, I think Bob and I actually, along with uh, Professor Livingston, who was mentioned earlier, are are writing a book about uh, media coverage of the Iraq War. And I think one thing that I would say that I think would be sort of value neutral um, about and answer to your question and relevant to today's discussion is that. What happened in turn, what, one way we can think about what happened during that period uh, without getting ideological about, well, partisan about it, is that uh, the press accepted certain claims and that those claims were mostly claims from the White House when they had the option of other official claims, by the way, from the intelligence agencies, but not at senior levels. So, for instance, in one of the classic examples that's often bandied about, on the same day that there's an A1 story in the Post touting official claims about, I, I think it was aluminum tubes in this particular case, <clears throat> on page A18, there's a story questioning those very claims, not from Code Pink and other lefties, but from intelligence analysts, right? So the question, an operational question is, so why, why does it look like that? Why does the one story get here and the one story get front page coverage? And I think one of the arguments that, that Bob and Steve and I are making is that this isn't something that just happened in 2002, 2003, that really this is a pattern in American media coverage during the lead up to major American wars is that that cover, and this would span Democratic and Republican uh, administrations, which is why it's nonpartisan, that it's the tendency to privilege White House claims over other claims. And those other claims could be uh, a, a foreign opinion, it could be um, international agencies, UN, et cetera. It could be uh, lesser members of Congress. The point is, is that there is a certain pattern that we see that is repeated through history. Um, and sometimes those claims are on the up and up. Sometimes those claims, as in Vietnam, are proven to be actual lies. Sometimes, at the very minimum, uh, in, say, the Iraq case, it's people uh, believing one set of, of data that they like and not believing another set, and that argument getting primacy over other arguments. So, but the the pattern there isn't really a partisan pattern, it's a pattern about accepting White House claims over other claims, which is kind of the point we were trying to yeah. make earlier. Uh, uh, no. At one point, sir, 60% of the American people believe that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11, which uh, I think indicates how well the disinformation campaign started by the neocons, and I saw it myself at Vice President Cheney uh, at a reception he was giving for Scooter Libby's uh, paperback of his hardback called The Apprentice, and that was one year before the war. And at one point I said, well, if, the, if we should go to war, and I was shouted down by the neocons, what do you mean if we should go to war? It's been decided we are going to war. So I'm sorry, there was a major disinformation campaign there. It was the most unnecessary war of my career, and I've covered 18 wars, and I served in World War II. I think it was an utter disgrace. Well, I, I, the, the line between disinformation and lies is one we'll have to talk about. But, but uh, let me just say one thing in response to one of your questions, which is, do the media learn from these experiences? Another part of our, of our um, uh, research uh, would show that, no, that even, even after the New York Times and Washington Post both published admirable mea culpas and analyses of how we got the pre-war story so wrong and so on, uh, they continue to do the same thing that Sean just was talking about, that is relying very heavily on the White House, even publishing literally a, a, a false White House claim on page one. The next day, uh, this was a claim about Iranians supplying weapons to Iraqi uh, insurgents. Uh, the next day on A18, uh, publishing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs saying, uh, we don't know anything about the Iranians publish, you know, giving weapons. There's no evidence of that. Um, and so, in other words, the learning from the past mistakes is not something that goes on in the media, uh, at least not in covering foreign policy, maybe more so in other issues. Uh, however, I should also say that the learning doesn't go on in government either very well, <laughs> because, you know, there are all kinds of lessons we might have learned from some of our previous uh, difficult, protracted wars that we didn't seem to apply in the current situations. And the oh my God story is page one, and the oh never mind story is on... A18 or A20 or whatever. And even if it's not so much of an oh my god, it's okay, you know, it's another, really, it's a predictable White House release, but it's the president. 
And, and I think there's so much privileging of that that it, it sort of overcomes even standard news judgments. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it also makes the White House correspondent the senior correspondent in the American uh, pantheon. You know, mm -hmm. the, the White House is the apex uh, of the most privileged senior correspondence. And yet Which, so that's a very good yeah. point because yeah. they, they're not so. in a position to necessarily exactly. know, right. for example, in that Iranian weapon story. That was debunked six months ago, by the way, in the very same Washington Post that then put it six months later on page one. When was the last time a White House reporter broke a major story about the White House? You know, yeah. Those stories come from <laughs> intelligence reporters, they come from other yes. beat reporters, yeah. they come from independent reporters, they, uh, they come from foreign well, I reporters. I was uh, credited to the White House for five years and I used to go there to the White House. Pretty they're basically stenographers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they don't have time but, to do anything else. But, but they have the status. <laughs> and, Especially and now, with t uh, you know, because they have to also be blogging and tweeting all day. <laughs> and if they're on television, then they have to be doing stand-ups all day. And if they're on cable, they have to do stand-ups like mm -hmm. CNN. They have to do, we had a, a former student come here a few years ago, and it was for CNN, Dana Bash, and she was talking about, you know, her day in a given hour, just to do five stand-ups. Well, when does she have time to do any reporting? How can you hold any official I accountable? Think. If you're doing five stand-ups yeah, an hour. But they also don't have specialist knowledge in, in most of the subjects that they cover. I mean, you, you give them an economic story. I mean, the, 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 it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I remember when the G7, they started having summits, right. economic summits. Yeah. And, of course, the White House correspondent went. Yeah, why the does the White House correspondent and, go to the and, G7? And, 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 <laughs> but they were terrified right. that they might have to write an economic story. Well, that's math. That's a whole other problem. <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> so... Actually, the uh, leaders got very smart, and, and uh, on the first evening, they would always uh, slip them out a political story to so that they had something to write about. So they were so relieved they didn't have to write about <laughs> economics that they would devour whatever political uh, line they were fed. Now, if there are no more questions, um, does any uh, uh, on the final panel have a final? We, we, we've just got room if there's another question, but then yes. we're going to finish. I yes? This woman here, yeah. Go ahead. I can't see because yeah, of the, all this these the last uh, one. spotlights. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, my name's Asta. I'm an undergrad at GW. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, you all kind of touched upon this earlier, each of you. Um, what do you all think is the most underreported story today? Um, the media. Most. Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, that'd be good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, think. I think uh, it's it's <laughs> in the world of confusions. I think uh, the media and the, what I'm uh, understanding by your discussion that is you're really creating more confusions by the media in the world. Um, uh, okay, just just it's a very so a simple question that how do you see the conventional and uh, <coughs> new media in the world where the literacy is the major problem, but if you see the whole world, if the more than the half of the world, it's underliterate, and we are talking about the online media, the satellite, and so many things, and where do you see that technology uh, matters against these actions? I think I mentioned the technology, the 4.3 million cell phones that we have now, and you get news with your cell phone. And if you've got the right uh, uh, set or instrument, you can even get uh, CNN on the thing and uh, BBC on your cell telephone in the middle of Africa. So I think that, that answers your question about how we're going to cope with uh, illiteracy and uh, how does one get news to people who can't read or write. Let's just run around the panel, and this will be the closing uh, round. Uh, <laughs> Matt. Most least covered topic. Uh, least covered topic? Um, gosh, I think for my money, it's got to be um, Obama's appointments, particularly his appointments to the Fed that just languished, even as economic policy, interest rates, fiscal policy is absolutely the critical issue in American politics. And these, uh, these uh, nominees were just sitting there. Um, not being acted on, and I think that that's, I think that was a, that was a structure, I think that's not too surprising, but I think it represents a structural failure of U.S. media. Well, I already mentioned what I think are underreported stories by U.S. media, but I can, I can switch the question, and I, I think there are some things that we as foreign 
uh, correspondents under report on in Europe. I think we should report more on Congress, actually. We, we tend to focus on the White House and the President and do, don't do as much uh, stories about the Congress. And people in Sweden, everybody knows President Obama, but I don't, I don't think that many people know who Harry Reid is so, or John Boehner. And <coughs> that's true in America, too. <laughs> that's true. It is. It is. <laughs> but, but I think fr from a European perspective, we should really, and I should, uh, be better at reporting about the Congress. It's not as sexy as doing the White House, but it's, it's very important. I interpreted the question as maybe uh, America and the world, and I'd say uh, uh, poverty and its its structural uh, reasons and its and its implications from national security to uh, gender violence and violence against children, et cetera. But I think poverty and all of its attendant issues is really the core uh, question facing the world and development, et cetera. The most underreported story from my standpoint is what we've allowed to happen to democratic capitalism since the end of the Cold War a beautiful system that gradually morphed into crony capitalism and then casino capitalism and then bandit capitalism to the point where now Pete Peterson says, we have a carnivorous and animalistic system. Pete Peterson made about a billion dollars for himself, but uh, this is what he said at the <laughs> Council on Foreign Relations the other day. Oh, I, I just agree with everything that's been said. Um, let me add an underreported story from my perspective. Of course, that's a value judgment, what's underreported. Uh, you know, the Little League scores in, in Little Rock are un underreported. But the. No, not, not when uh, Clinton was there. Uh, no, it's <laughs> not. Um, uh, the United States has 865 military bases or more around the world. The United States spends more on defense than most of the rest of the world combined. Yep. We keep some 40,000 troops in Germany to deter the Soviet Union from invading uh, West Germany. Uh, uh, that is, that's really not focused on, and particularly the opportunity costs of maintaining these unnecessary uh, structures uh, when China and our uh, other uh, friends and competitors uh, don't, don't suffer under that burden including 9,000 tanks that we still have in the arsenal, and no one can see a tank war coming anytime soon. <laughs> Unless you go back in history. Yeah. yeah, well, lots of other people got tanks. We could have a, a sort of... Just for get, fun. <laughs> tournament. <laughs> um, I would say that this question of, of following the government's lead in, in um, the subjects that are covered is, is really important, and, and is even more important in foreign policy because in domestic policy, people do dig around a bit and they try and get dirt on people during elections and they wonder what the Pentagon's up to and is somebody pulling the wool over our eyes. But in foreign policy, it doesn't happen at all. And, and, and the whole of, of uh, since Obama came to power, the, the reporting of his foreign policy has been dictated simply by where he's been and, and what he's done. And there are huge gaps. I mean, uh, as a European, and, and, uh, I'm sure our, my Swedish colleague will agree that there's no reporting of Europe in this country, or very little, and it's certainly no systematic. And when, when, when the president does make a foreign policy initiative, it's sort of automatically assumed that it's a good thing. He's reset relations with Russia. He's signed an arms agreement. It's great, uh, bravo, a plus. But nobody actually looks at, is it a good idea to have this arms agreement? Was, was it a, a, a well-negotiated answer? No. Um, there's no, there's no uh, analysis at all of, of, of anything foreign that's an agreement is somehow a plus. Uh, and, and yet, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, the sort of preconceived ideas, Obama is multilateral after Bush was unilateral. Uh, but, uh, there are two huge multilateral uh, events going on or not going on in the world today, but the two biggest in multilateral issues uh, are the climate change negotiations, which Obama has been a complete flop at, uh, and the uh, Doha round of multilateral trade talks, which he hasn't even, I don't even think sure he's even aware that they exist. He, he never mentions them. But there are these two huge multilateral operations which completely vanish from the radar screen and nobody seems to uh, bother. But the trouble, Reggie, is that that doesn't exactly dispatch you out of the Western Hemisphere, does it, reading about the about the Doha 
round and things like that. It's very difficult to turn that into a story that's comprehensible for the average reader. It's very hard to put it in one of those supermarket weekly weekly things. You know, you should get these Fleet Street hacks going, going on it. You know, put the sex in Doha. <laughs> I think I'd frown on that. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I want to draw it to a close now. Thank you very much for staying with us and for your questions, and so particularly thanks to the panel. For uh, I, I'm glad, to, very glad to have moderated a panel where not everyone agreed with each other, which is makes a very nice <coughs> change. But I think it's been highly enlightening, and I thank everyone who participated, including the technicians and the people who organised this. Uh, one of whom, um, my bank coordinator, Sarah, is sitting in the front row. Thank you all very, very much indeed. And uh, I think you have family connection with us as well. Yes, um, my son Max is the videographer back there. Yeah. Coincidental, it wasn't an inside job. No. So thank you all very much, and thank the panel. Thank you. Same here, enjoy it. <laughs>